Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's MenMD Real Talk webinar, When ED Pills Don't Work, What's Next? My name is Ashton, and I'll be your moderator for this event. I work on the marketing team here at MenMD, and I'm excited to be hosting the session today. But before we get started, we have a short disclaimer that we need to review. The health and medical information provided during this webinar, as well as the questions and responses from the webinar providers, are solely for informational purposes. This content is not intended to take the place of advice or treatment from health professionals. Nothing presented in the webinar is intended to be used for medical evaluation, diagnosis, or treatment. It is not intended to substitute for your relationships with your own healthcare and pharmaceutical providers. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider before beginning any new treatment or if you have questions regarding a medical condition. With that being noted, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Gerard Pregenzer. Dr. Pregenzer is a board certified urologist at Pregenzer Urology with locations in Enfield and Hartfield, Connecticut. He is well known for providing state of the art treatments and services for sexual health. Today, he's going to cover the underlying causes of ED medical treatment options beyond pills, surgical treatment options, conduct a short demo, and then hold a live Q&A to close out the webinar. All right, thanks guys. So tonight we're gonna to talk about something that uh, is very important in my practice, and that's erectile dysfunction. I wanna talk about what exactly erectile dysfunction is, who has it, and what causes it. So erectile dysfunction, is defined as the persistent inability to achieve and maintain an erection adequate for satisfactory sexual intercourse. One in five American men over the age of 20 years old experience ED in their lifetime. More than half of men over the age of 40 have some degree of ED, and ED affects approximately 39 million American men. This is a serious problem and one that does not get as much attention as it deserves in my opinion. There are a number of physical causes and conditions that are associated with ED. And honestly, this is a reason why, as we were saying before, it's important to have a relationship with your healthcare provider. Uh, you know, that this is not, you know, treating ED is not like just ordering a Big Mac at McDonald's. You know, you wanna have a professional who can help you through this process. Notice uh, in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen, cardiovascular disease uh, is associated with 40% of cases of erectile dysfunction. If you look on the right-hand side of your screen, I'm going to explain why that is. You know, in heart disease, that that that's related to plaque buildup in your coronary arteries or the arteries of your heart. Well, in the human body, it appears that equal amounts of plaque are applied to the inner lining of the arteries simultaneously. So those penile arteries tend to fill up first, and once you hit a 50% obstruction, so half of that internal internal part of the artery being filled with plaque, that's when you start to see erectile dysfunction. Now notice that the coronary arteries, the ones right below those penile arteries in that graph there or in that, in that image, they're about double the size of the penile arteries. And this is one of the reasons why we think that men who do eventually have heart attacks very frequently will have erectile dysfunction present maybe a few, maybe three years before their heart attacks. So if you're having ED, you know, it, it's important to get some kind of, of medical evaluation. I've had a number of guys in my practice will come out and I'm the first doctor they've seen in like 10 years and they're coming to see me because they have ED. And I'll ask them, first thing I say is, do you have a primary care doctor? And if they say no, I say, well, there's a very nice one right down the street. Here's your number, go and see her because I need you to get checked out. Now also look, number two on this list here, diabetes at 30%, probably, um, the number two issue in my practice I see with patients who come in with ED is diabetes. And men with diabetes tend to have a more difficult form of erectile dysfunction to treat. Uh, and, so it, and so it can get tricky. Uh, so again, another important reason to have a, a physician who's familiar with treating erectile dysfunction and these other issues you know, firmly in your corner. Let's talk about the erection process. When aroused, the nerves surrounding the penis become active. Muscles around the arteries then relax and more blood flows into the penis. The additional blood then makes the penis stiff and hard or erect, and the erection tightens the veins so the blood can't leave the penis, enabling the penis to remain erect. So how do ED medications work? They work by increasing the blood flow to the penis to achieve and maintain an erection strong enough for the entirety of sexual intercourse. 
Now, there are a number of different kinds of healthcare professionals who can help to treat erectile dysfunction. A general practice or family doctor has a general understanding of erectile dysfunction and is able to prescribe medical treatment options. Urologist is a doctor who has specialized training that focuses on the surgical and medical diseases of the male and female urinary tract systems and the male reproductive organs. A prosthetic urologist or an ED specialist has additional training specific to men's health and erectile dysfunction and specializes in the penile implant procedure. Now we're going to go over a number of treatment options for erectile dysfunction. These include oral medications, intraurethral gel or a needleless insertion, penile injections, vacuum erection devices, and the penile implant. Oral medications form the first line of therapy when it comes to erectile dysfunction. They're effective for up to 75% of men with ED. They're taken by mouth one to two hours before anticipated sexual activity. They enhance blood flow to the spongy tissue in the penis and require sexual stimulation to work. Sildenafil, which is generic Viagra, typically is effective for up to four hours. Sodalafil or Cialis is up to 36 hours. They're not recommended if you take alpha blockers for high blood pressure or if you have low blood pressure or if you have uncontrolled hypertension. Now, this one here is critical. Do not take these medications if you also take nitrate medications for cardiac conditions like nitroglycerin uh, or other related medications. That can be a very, very, very dangerous combination. Side effects of these medications include facial flushing, nasal congestion, blurred vision, headaches, heartburn, back pain, or muscle pain. The sildenafil, as you see on the right side of your screen, is available in various tablet strengths. Tadalafil is available both as tablets and lozenges. And I'll just, I'll just tell you from my own clinical experience, the lozenges, um, you know, they, they tend to actually work a little bit quicker and appear to give a little bit more of a potent effect, but the tablets are, are very excellent as well. Next up is the intraurethral gel, which is a needleless insertion of medication directly into the penis. This is a medication that comes in a pre-filled needleless syringe that's inserted into the urethra. Onset of erection is within five to 15 minutes. It is very effective. Uh, it's more effective than oral meds, but less than injection therapy for erectile dysfunction. In the clinical literature, success rates are reported for up to 65% of men who use this. And that includes a lot of the men who have failed the oral medications. Most common side effects include urethral pain or burning with application, and sometimes something called a priapism or a prolonged painful erection. You do need to store these used or full syringes in the refrigerator, and they come in various strengths and combination medication formulations. Next up is intracavernosal injection therapy, and this in my practice is where most men go when the oral medications fail to work for them. This is a self-injected medication that's placed directly into the corpus cavernosa, and that's the erectile tissue of the penis. Onset of erection occurs within about five to 15 minutes. Um, this, is, this therapy is the most effective non-surgical treatment for erectile dysfunction, with success rates reported up to 90% in the clinical literature. Again, most common side effects, priapism or prolonged painful erection, which I should also mention that is a urologic emergency. If you ever have, if you're ever taking one of these medications, whether it's a pill or an intraurethral gel or one of these injectables, and you have a, an erection with pain, that's an emergency. So I tell my patients, because I always do a test injection in the office, and when I send them home, I say, if you have pain with an erection, you call me. If I'm in the office, get your button to my office immediately. If not, go to the emergency room, because this needs to be taken care of stat, okay? Other reported side effects, penile fibrosis, scar tissue, hematomas or a collection of blood under the skin, pain after injection, local infections, and potentially penile curvature. Partially used or full vials must be refrigerated. And the vial must be discarded about 28 days after the first puncture. Again, this is available in various formulations from uh, MenMD, and uh, it's, it's a very, very useful tool uh, for erectile dysfunction. 
Next up is the vacuum erection device, which can be used for sexual activity and penile re rehabilitation. I actually like this a lot, and I advise all of my men with erectile dysfunction or those men who are undergoing treatments for prostate cancer who may need some penile rehab to use this. So how does it work for sex? You take a hollow plastic tube, which is the penile pump, it's placed over the penis, then you have either a manual or battery powered pump that's used to create a vacuum that pulls blood into the penis. Once you've got an erection, you take an elastic tension ring and place it at the base of the penis to help maintain the erection. And patient satisfaction rates range from 68 to 80%. Most common side effects include uh, blocked ejaculation, and that's that'll happen because of that elastic ring. That ring has to be tight enough to keep the blood in the penis if it's also compressing your urethra on the underside of the penis, that'll also potentially block your ejaculation, and that can be uncomfortable for some men. It can also cause penile numbness, bruising, or discomfort. The other thing that I'll note here is that if you put a ring on and it's tight enough to prevent loss of blood flow, or loss of blood, I should say, from the penis to maintain that erection, you can only keep that ring on for about 30 minutes. You leave it on for longer than that, you can cause some damage to your erectile tissue. Now for penile rehabilitation, you wanna use the vacuum erection device three to five times per week. And in my world, more is always better than less. So I say five times a week for about 20 to 30 minutes every time without using the ring, okay? And the way that you do this is you pump it up, get your full erection and you leave the, uh, the vacuum on the penis. You don't take it off, you leave it on for that full 20 to 30 minutes. And the reason why you're doing it without the ring is that you're cycling that good blood flow into the erectile tissue. This therapy can be used to maintain penile length for men with ED. Um, and a lot of times if I have guys and you know they're going through the process of you know using their their different uh, you know different interventions for erectile dysfunction. They're sort of working their way through. I tell them, look, if what you're doing is not getting you good regular erections, use this as an adjunct to make sure you do don't lose length or girth. It's often also recommended for men who have had uh, prostate or radical pelvic surgery. It's often recommended for men with ED when loss of nocturnal erections occur. Now, nocturnal erections work to flood the penis with oxygen-rich blood to engorge, stretch, and revitalize the penile tissue. And as men age, it is common for the frequency of nocturnal erections to diminish. And look, when I have a guy who, let's say he's 50, 60 years old, and he hasn't had an erection in, let's say, five years, and I'll show him what we call stretched penile length, and that's where I actually, I actually grab the head of his penis and I pull hard, I'm not trying to hurt him, but I'm just trying to show him what he's got for length. And I'll always look at him and say, like, this is not what you remember from when you were 18. And invariably, they all agree. It's not. And the reason why is they've gone without erections for a period of time. They haven't had that good cycling of good, you know, oxygen-rich blood. So they're losing tissue. So if you're not getting those regular erections, at the very least, use this device. You know, keep your penile length. Now, penile implants offer discrete solutions for erectile dysfunction. In the penile implant, this is a pair of cylinders that's implanted directly into the penis with a pump placed inside the scrotum and a reservoir of saline placed in the lower abdomen. Squeezing and releasing that pump moves fluid into the cylinders, creating an erection. You deflate the device by pressing the deflate button on the pump. The penis then returns to a soft, flaccid, natural looking state. Now this device has high patient and partner satisfaction. On-demand erections last as long as desired. It typically does not interfere with ejaculatory function. I tell all my guys, look, if you could ejaculate without the device, you should be able to ejaculate with the device. It should have no effect. At seven years, 94% of these are still in use and free from revision, uh, which that's quite honestly a remarkable number. Next up, we have a penile implant demonstration video. I'll provide some narration here. So in here, the animation sh showing squeezing the pump to move fluid from the reservoir, which you see in the upper portion of the screen into the cylinders inside the penis. And now he's gonna move hand positions to squeeze the deflate button to return the fluid from the cylinders back into that reservoir.
Now, the penile implant is placed through a surgical procedure, and surgical procedures always have possible risks. Some physicians recommend attempting less invasive ED treatments before choosing the implant option, while other physicians don't view ED treatment choices as linear, meaning having to go from pills to implant in a specific order. Um, what I'll say is I always advise patients to use whatever the least invasive therapy is that works, okay? So if pills work and you're happy using pills, use it, use them. If it's the injections for you, do the injections. If it's the vacuum, use the vacuum. If those aren't working, don't torture yourself. Don't keep trying to use something that's not going to work, you know? And the penile implant is a great, great tool for the treatment of erectile dysfunction. It's really as close as you get to a permanent cure. Health insurance coverage may vary. Natural or spontaneous erections are not possible once you have a penile implant. And that's obvious. And I always sort of find this, this statement here a little bit ironic because I would never put a penile implant in a man who was having natural spontaneous erections that were adequate for sexual intercourse. Um, but nonetheless, be aware that once the implant goes in, that's the only way you get an erection from that point on. Mechanical failure of the implant may require revision surgery. Remember, the penile implant is a mechanical device just like your car. Can you get a lemon from the auto dealership? Yeah. Can you get a lemon as a penile implant? Yeah. I've seen one. I've seen one. And in that case, removal and replacement is the way to go. It is possible that removal and replacement can cause the penis to become shorter, curved, or scarred. Pain or infection can occur, which typically happens during the healing process. Um, men with diabetes, spinal cord injuries, or open sores may have an increased risk of infection. Men with diabetes in particular, you have about a double risk of infection. It's still very low, maybe about 1% of cases, but it's something to consider. For more information, talk to your prosthetic urologist to learn more about the implant option. Get answers to your common questions about penile implants and insurance coverage at edcure.org. This webinar was generously co-sponsored by Boston Scientific. They've been great partners in my practice, by the way. I really appreciate their help. So a lot of guys will think that, you know, when they hear penile injection therapy, you know, they're thinking that you've got this huge needle. They're going to get harpooned like Captain Ahab skewering the white whale. It is the smallest needle on the market. I don't know if you can even see it up there. This is an insulin syringe. It's teeny, teeny tiny. Okay. So what you want to do, if you're going to draw up some medication, if you've never done it before, whatever amount of medication you're going to draw up, let's say it's going to be 10 units, and you might not be able to see it because of the focus on that camera. Uh, let's say you're going to do 10 units of medication. You draw your syringe back to the 10 on the syringe. You take your little alcohol pad and your vial. You wipe off the vial, the top of the vial with your alcohol pad. Now that's clean. And there's a little gray rubber stopper in the top of that. You're going to put your syringe directly into the rubber stopper. You're going to put the air into the vial. And you're going to draw back until you get the amount of medication you're supposed to have in there. Take that out. And then you're going to take, this is the best part. You're going to take the limp penis here. Now, where do you inject? You do not inject in the top or in the bottom or in the head. You want to get somewhere around the base of the penis, right on the side. You go three o'clock or nine o'clock, okay? One side or the other. Now, you want to alternate which side you use. So don't always be going on the right. That's a great way to get a rightward curvature, okay? You're going to go right one time left the other time. You've got your syringe. You've got the penis. You're going to put the syringe directly into the side and hub that needle. Get it all the way in. Don't be squeamish about this. It doesn't hurt. Like a little, little teeny tiny pinch. Put all of the medication straight in. Take it out. Discard your needle properly. Now that's in there. It does require sexual stimulation in order to develop an erection, but after about five to 15 minutes, you get something that looks more like that. 
very effective therapy. Next, I have a model of the penile implant in a lifelike mannequin, thanks to our folks at Boston Scientific. There is the pump down here in the scrotum. Can't see it because it's inside the body. And you pump the pump. I'm going to squeeze that. It's going to transfer fluid from the reservoir. Again, that's generally up in the abdomen, usually next to the bladder. And as you can see, every time I squeeze, that penis is becoming more erect. And you keep squeezing until you can't squeeze anymore. The larger the implant, the more squeezes it takes. And by the way, the size implant that you get is dictated by your internal anatomy. I've had some guys come to me and say that, that they want me to put in the largest implant that I have. Say it doesn't work that way. You get the biggest one that your body can tolerate. All right. And this is super hard. Okay. I could take this and bash this against that brick wall back there. This is a very, very hard erection here. Now, when you're done with your erection, you squeeze a deflate button on the same pump. So I was squeezing down here to move the fluid into the cylinders. And I'm going to squeeze right above it. I can feel a little button in here. And notice that the fluid is returning out of the cylinders back to the reservoir. So you go from being hard for the bedroom to soft for the locker room afterwards. I have a number of patients in my practice. I swear they tell me that their partners do not know that they have a penile implant. Because it does look really quite natural was in the deflated state, and it's very effective when it's in the inflated state. So with that, those are the props I have here. Uh, if you guys wanna go through some of the Q&A, we can do that. First question here is, how does one also address ED caused by stress? Is the remedy different from just medication? Um, well, if you're able to reduce stress, that could certainly help. And I, I do regularly refer my, uh, my patients with sexual dysfunction to, um, to a sex therapist, if it seems like that may help, because sometimes there are some relationship stressors. Um, although honestly, the, you know, the pills will still help with stress. Uh, they don't, they don't treat the stress. But the way that stress interferes with your ability to perform in the bedroom is that that part of the nervous system that responds to stress, right? So the cortisol pathway, you know, it's, it, it, it's, that, it's that adrenaline rush that you get when you're being chased by a tiger. It is the world's most powerful erection killer, okay? So if you've got a powerful outflow from that side of your nervous system, it's gonna be very difficult to get an erection. Now, that being said, you know, the pills can help and all the other treatments can help as well. Uh, but I would certainly recommend trying to do whatever you can to reduce stress, understanding that, hey, look, I live in a stressful world. I get it that that's sometimes easier said than done, but that's that's my story. Awesome. All righty. Next question here. How does long-term type 1 diabetes affect my choices for ED treatment options? Kind of briefly covered that, but... That no, that's, I love that question. So, so the here, so I, I, I'm I'm going to get a little a little inside baseball here in terms of in terms of why diabetes is is tough. So, for instance, the way that like Viagra and Cialis and their generic equivalents, sildenafil and tadalafil, uh, work, is that they work at the level of the endothelium, which is the lining of your blood vessel. Okay, and what happens is that they inhibit uh, an enzyme that breaks down the nitric oxide pathway of erectile function. Okay, so basically it's it's helping the substance to persist at the at the level of the blood vessel lining. The problem with diabetes is that the lining of the blood vessel is what's damaged by diabetes. So you don't get the release of that substance in the first place, or at least you get substantially diminished release. So the reason why Viagra won't work in a really bad diabetic is because they don't even have the stuff to work with in the first place. Now injections can work, okay? But probably, you know, honestly, I was saying that, you know, diabetes may be number two. I think honestly in my practice, diabetes is probably number one. 
uh, in terms of the most common comorbidity that I see uh, in erectile dysfunction patients who end up going to the implant. Now, I'll always put them you know, through the pills first and recommend that they try something like the injections. Um, but, but diabetics tend to be, tend to be tougher to treat. And usually I am more aggressive with them in terms of encouraging them to keep on moving through the pathway and not to suffer needlessly with, um, you know, with some treatments if they're not working. Those also, by the way, are the guys that I will strongly encourage to use the vacuum device because I know they're not getting good erections on a regular basis and you want to do everything you can to preserve as much volume, as much penile volume as you can. All righty. Next question here. How does the effectiveness of injection therapy compare to intraurethral gels? Injection therapy, uh, penile injection therapy is more effective. Um, you know, for me, the penile gels are generally a smaller, uh, a much smaller portion uh, of my of, of my treatment paradigm, just because you know, if a guy's going to put a medication, uh, most guys want the more effective medication in their penis, and that's going to be the injections. The guys who have a real needle phobia that tend to move to the urethral gel first, and it does work. Uh, it works better than the than the pills, but not as well as the as the actual needle injections. Next question: I've been on hormone therapy for two years, and my penis is about half as big as it used to be. Can my normal size be restored? Well, I think that depends on a number of factors. So there's a lot that goes into penile size. So there's internal and external size. A lot of guys who come to see me who say that they've lost a lot of length have also gained a fair amount of weight. And if you carry a fair amount of fat, let's say in what we call the suprapubic fat pad, that can cause some bearing of the penis. And in general, we say that for every 30 pounds you are overweight, you'll lose an inch of penis. So you think about that. Um, you know, the other thing is that if you haven't been getting good, uh, you know, erections on a regular basis, uh, like I said, you can permanently lose some length. That being said, there there is some data out there that suggests that things like penile traction devices may be able to restore some length. I don't know if there's any data, honestly, offhand on the vacuum device in terms of whether that will also do the same thing. But in terms of penile size, maintenance is what you need to focus on. If you have lost some size, don't lose any more, right? There are there are very few things that will help you to maintain what you have. You know, the vacuum erection device can help. The penile implant can absolutely stop loss of length. Once it's in there, you don't lose any more. And that's one of the reasons why with my post prostatectomy guys, I'm very aggressive where if I feel like the penile implant is where they're going to go, I really try to encourage them to get there sooner rather than later because time is penis when you're losing length. All righty, next question here. I have mild ED, will diet and exercise reverse my ED naturally or is medication the only solution? So I love diet and exercise um, and I guess it depends on what you mean by mild. So, you know, there are a number of things that go into erectile function and erectile dysfunction. So if it's, if it's very, very mild, then sure, you know, diet and exercise I think can can you know help to make it better? How much better? Um, I don't know. You know, I certainly don't dissuade men from starting medication in addition to diet and exercise. And you know, here's the deal. You know, time is your enemy, right? There are very few things that you can do uh, to put the odds more so in your favor. Uh, diet and exercise are going to be the cornerstone for your continued functional status. So. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that that I always tell guys to consider is that, you know, in life, you do, you know, function goes like this over time, right? I can't, there's nothing that can really make it do this, right? But maybe we can level it off so it's not so steep and maybe it can be more like that for as long as possible. Now you add pills and you can kind of do that, but your trajectory is still going to be downward over time, right? Same thing with injections. Um, you know, you you improve your baseline. Diet and exercise absolutely will help to slow progression of what you've got going on in terms of actual reversal. I haven't seen it be uh, as effective as other means. Okay, we got our next question here. I have a recent non-existent libido. 
Is it due to my ED or is there something else going on? I feel like I need to know you better to answer that question. Um, so I do know that there are some guys who will have substantial loss of libido because they don't even want to try because they know that, you know, they have a history of poor performance and then like, why even bother? You know, maybe they disappoint themselves or their partners. So they kind of get depressed. They don't want to do it anymore. Um, but in terms of, you know, is the, the reduced libido definitely because of the erectile dysfunction? I'm not entirely sure. Um, you know, that can also be due to other things, altered body image, um, sometimes, sometimes a lower than normal testosterone. Um, although I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not quick to point my finger at abnormal testosterone levels unless I'm really convinced. And that's something that you can do in terms of looking at someone's, uh, symptoms, loss of libido being one, erectile dysfunction being another one, loss of, uh, lean muscle mass, increased fat, depression, fatigue, hot flashes, mood swings, that sort of thing. You check its testosterone level if it's abnormally low. If you replace it and you feel better, then yeah, it was because of the loss of, you know, the lower testosterone. I've also had the rare guy who feels that way has a low testosterone. You replace his testosterone back to a normal level, and he still has a lower libido. Um, that's another place where the help of a well-qualified, well-trained sex therapist can be truly invaluable. And I, again, like I said before, I, I do partner um, with a good sex therapist in the area. Awesome. So this question <clears throat> just came in. We also had it before. Um, can I use Viagra or Cialis in co combination with injections, VEDs, or intraurethral gels? Um, can you? I mean, you can do whatever you want. Um, you know, there are off-label treatment options. So uh, you know, I've had. I mean, there, in my practice. In general, what I do is strategize with a patient what's going to work. So, you know, without without knowing this person or what their situation is, you know, I'm not going to tell them that they should do something. But you know, let me let me give you some examples of things that I have advised my patients to do. You know, there are off-label ways to dose things like the sildenafil or Viagra and the Cialis. And one of the things that you can do is do like the daily low dose of Cialis, AKA Tadalafil, and then add an on-demand Viagra, AKA Sildenafil. I have patients who also will use one or both oral medications and the vacuum erection device. That one's easy for me to say, yeah, go ahead and do it because the vacuum erection device is not an additive um, uh, medication. So it's kind of easier for me to, to, to more freely say, yeah, use it with whatever else you're using. In terms of combining the pills plus the injections, those injections are pretty darn powerful. You know, I would be honestly worried about getting a priapism. I think I've had one patient in the past who wanted to use like a hundred milligram Viagra plus a fairly high dose injection. He swore that that was the only way he could get an erection. And I told him, I said, okay, you know, if that's what's going to take for you to get an erection, do it. Be aware that a priapism is a is a potential complication. And I told him, I said, let me know when you're going to do this. Do it on a day when I'm in the office and I will have the reversal medication on hand and you call me the second you have pain if you have pain. Now, thank God, you know, he he did okay, but but some guys do wind up with a priapism, um, which is a problem. Um, in terms of combining it with the gels, I mean, again, sort of same principle applies. I'm I'm nervous about combining those higher strength medications together because while they will increase your chance of getting an erection it might not be the kind of erection that you want you don't want the erection that lands you in the emergency room uh getting um you know getting a a, a real needle in your penis to pull the blood out be careful no we do not want that <clears throat> all right next question here's uh, kind of along the same lines about combining modalities um this person wants to know if you happen to be using a VED with injection therapy, what the proper order is to use the two. Um, should they use the VED then inject or inject then VED? Well, uh, I would probably inject first, get as much of an erection as you can. So again, you know, if, if you are using the VED, so let's say you pump it up, you know, you get the constriction band down around the base of the penis and then you inject, that blood in the penis is static. 
right? So the medication that you inject is not going to flow as freely through the corporal tissue. At least that's that's how I would think of it. I don't know that anybody has done a study on this to see if you know what happens, but I would think inject first, stimulate for five to fifteen minutes, see what you can get. If you're not where you need to be, add the uh, you know add the vacuum on top of that. That that's what I would probably do. Again, be very careful when you're doing this sort of stuff. And do not leave that ring on for more than 30 minutes. I had a patient come in to see me a couple of years ago um, because he had he had done that. He decided to uh, you know, use, uh, use a vacuum erection device, put a ring on his penis, and then go and get high and party and passed out for six hours and woke up and took the ring off his penis. And then he wasn't able to get an erection with anything. That's not good. So be careful when you're doing this stuff. Yes, definitely don't keep it on for that long. Alrighty, so <clears throat> next question here um, is about when someone's considering an implant. They want to know um, if injection therapy is still working, should I not consider it a penile implant? I mean, it depends on how happy you are with the injection therapy. You know, if injection therapy is working great and if you're happy using it and there's no problems, hey, keep using it. Don't worry about the implant. On the other hand, I've had guys who, uh, yeah, you know, they're getting good, useful erections with the injections, but like, you know, they don't care for the lack of spontaneity, you know, um, it, a lot of it depends on your social situation, um, you know, whether uh, sex is planned in your life or whether it's more spontaneous um, and, you know, different strokes for different folks. Uh, if you're jetting off to Mexico or the Caribbean, sometimes it's hard to pack a, uh, you know, a refrigerated vial of medication with you, uh, you know, bring the syringes and you can't be discreet with it. So if you may be with a partner that you don't want them to know that you're using something other than what God gave you to get an erection, you know, you may not want the injections, even though they're working, quote unquote, you might want to move on to something more discreet, like the penile implant or more spontaneous. That's another one, quite honestly, you, you know, usually the guys for you know the guys for whom the injectable medication is working and want to move on to something like the implant it's the guys who want more spontaneity you know they don't want to fill up a syringe and then inject the penis and then you know get back into a romantic mood they just want to reach down and pump their pump i have some patients who when their when their wife or significant other is in the mood will reach over and pump the pump for them i mean it does sort of add that you know playful spontaneity back to things uh it's not so sexy if your partner comes out with a needle to come and get you Next question here. Um, after injecting, I have an erection while standing, but when I go to lay down, it goes away. What is happening and how do I fix it? I don't know. That's real weird. Um, I guess it depends on other things that are going on when you're standing and when you're lying down. Uh, I have not honestly encountered that. I would want to know more. I would, I would go into a really deep dive with that patient and really get down to the nitty gritty of what is different other than standing and lying down? If that's the only thing, I'm not really quite sure why that would be happening. Alrighty. Next question here is about a new injection therapy user. They say they're having fears about inserting needles into the penis and they would like some help or suggestion about how to overcome those fears. Sure. Um, well, so there are um, there are devices that hide the needle. I think they're called auto injectors. Um, you know, in, in my practice, I kind of help them by going through the whole process in my office first. Um, so we kind of get over it together. Um, and we, we sort of get that first injection in there. Once you get the first one in the second one's a lot easier. Um, but yeah, there are those, like, I, I wish I had a prop. Um, but there are devices that basically hold the needle. So you don't see it. You just place it against the skin and you press a plunger and it basically drives needle in that can help i think yeah certainly we uh the auto injector is available in the MedMD shop as well so anyone listening that has that issue go ahead and get one so next question here i'm confused over the number of trimex variations how do i determine which one is best for me oh your doctor figures that out that's an easy question to answer Alrighty. So next question is, how often can you inject yourself? I've heard a few different things on this. Every day and three to four times per week, which is correct? I mean, I usually tell my patients that they, I, I tell them they should not do it more than once a day. 
I don't think that there's any data to say that you can't, that you have to do it like three or four times a week. I would not do it more than once a day. That's all I tell my patients. Alrighty, some good words of advice here. Next question. This person says, I'm finding it hard to ejaculate while using injection therapy, and they're wondering if that is normal. I would ask them if they have difficulty ejaculating with other modalities. Like if they, so so it is possible to ejaculate without an erection. And so I would ask them if they are ejaculating uh, more easily without an erection. I'd also ask them to be specific about exactly with, where they are injecting. Um, so, but I don't typically have that comment from men on injection therapy. So I, I probably want to get some more information. All right. Um, this question, you might have already covered something similar, but they're asking if the injection therapy can be used to increase penis length. No. So, and so penile length uh, is not something that can be easily increased. Um, you know, there, there are some studies that show that things like penile attraction can restore some loss length, especially in the post prostatectomy patient. There are no injections that can increase length. There are some cosmetic procedures that can increase girth. Uh, if you go on, but that's not permanent. Uh, if you go on, uh, on Google, you can find penile lengthening surgical procedures. Um, those are incredibly dangerous. And what will frequently happen with those is that, is a, so, I mean, it's an unstable procedure. It is not done in the United States, to my knowledge. Uh, it is done overseas. I think that there are some places in South America um, that do it, but there are horror stories of uh, basically men's penises falling apart after attempting to 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 increase their length. So um, that is that is not a a world that I like to dabble in. I say you've got what you got. Focus on not losing any more, and that's it. Yep. Alrighty. Speaking of implants and that such, we're moving on to some questions about that. This person asked, how long after surgery do they need to wait for their implant to be able to, or to participate in intercourse rather? Yeah. So that, so that depends. So some of that depends on the surgical approach that's done and how you're doing in terms of healing afterwards. Um, you know, the golden rule is always, it's whatever your doctor says. Uh, in my practice, most men uh, after a penile implant surgery are cleared for sexual activity by four weeks. Uh, some men may need a little bit longer, up to six weeks, um, but most are at about four. Already, not bad. Next question here. Does penile prosthesis affect urinary incontinence? Um, so it can. It's not, so the penile prosthesis is not placed for the purpose of treating urinary incontinence, but we do know that some men who have a little bit of mild stress incontinence, you know, and this is particularly true in the men who've had prostate surgery, where it's just a little bit, like a little bit, like a little drop or a little square, a little dampness with laugh, cough, lift, sneeze, um, you know, some sort of exertional movement, where if you put a penile implant in there, somehow it will increase the resistance just enough to prevent that in some men. There are also some adjunctive procedures that can be performed at the time of placement of a penile implant. There's something um, called a mini jupette, where basically it's like a little sling that's placed in tandem with the uh, with the penile implant, and it can increase the resistance uh, on the urethra. Um, so it, I guess that's a long way to say it can help with incontinence, but it is not designed to do so. Okay. <clears throat> this person is wondering, um, do you still get the same feeling and sensation with an implant and can you achieve an orgasm? Yes, to all of the above. That was easy. Yep. Next question right here is about um, injection therapy again. So this person said that they've tried biomix injections with some success, but still not a complete erection despite using 10 units. And they're wondering if switching to the trimix would solve the issue. It may. You know, it might, um, you know, either, so you can do a number of things. So, uh, you know, there's always, there's, there's a dose increase option and there's a concentration change option. And so typically what I'll do is, um, you know, I'll look at uh, whatever they're on and then we'll look at what the available concentrations are and see, well, where do you move next? 
Um, you know, honestly, one of the things that's that's helpful is I'll, I'll frequently have uh, men on a particular, uh, let's say a Trimix in, uh, injection dose. And normally I'll use Trimix. That's just been the convention in my practice. And what's been really great uh, for my patients, and I'll just I'll just give a plug for for you guys at MenMD for a second, is that um, you know the customer support at MenMD is really wonderful. They're very uh, responsive to uh, patient needs and patient experiences. And I will sometimes actually get suggestions directly from the pharmacists at MenMD saying, "Hey, this is what this patient is using for their injections. We recommend that you switch to such and such a concentration at this unit and try that." And I'll say, "Hey, that sounds great to me." Certainly. Yep. There's definitely some great customer service that we offer. 100%. So, next question here, kind of jumping around. This one's about VEDs. Um, this person asked, how common is skin tearing when using a vacuum device? Not very common in my practice. Uh, so, one of the things you want to make so, so first off, you got to use some lube with it. And uh, I believe that there is one that's uh, actually provided by the manufacturer. Um, and you, know, you really want to make sure that you're using a medical grade device. There are some lower quality devices that don't have the same sort of safety features like a like a max pressure valve. Um, so you want to be careful that you're not over pumping. And some men can become overzealous. And I think that, you know, they're they're trying to get the best possible direction they possibly can get. So they will jack up that pressure as much as the device will go. And if it's a lower quality device, it might not have the same sort of safety features. So, you know, I, I, I would make sure that you're using um, you know, a reputable device like the ones that are offered at MenMD, I would make sure that you're using the uh, the, pro the proper adjuncts like a proper lubricate. Certainly, definitely use the medical grade ones. Mm -hmm. So, question um, about injection therapy here. This person say after they injected, they had a sharp pain in their groin area. They're wondering what's going on. I would ask some more questions about that. I would say, you know, you know, define groin. Is it actually up in the groin crease? We're talking about in, in the penis. We're talking about one side. Other side, both sides. Does it radiate? Um, how long did it last? Did it go away? Um, so, anytime I hear about a lot of pain with an injection, I get a little bit concerned. But I would, I would look for more information in terms of what actually is going on. Alrighty, next question. I'm 83. Can injection still help me, or am I too old? Too old? If you're alive, you ain't too old. Don't say that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Injection can help you. And look. Um, you know, I have I have guys. It's you know, honestly, it's heartbreaking to hear some of the guys who come into my office and tell me that they feel like they're too old to treat their erectile dysfunction. I say, what do you mean? You know, and whether whether they're 83 or 93, you know, or or 53, I say, if do you want an erection or not? If the answer is yes, I say, well, here are the things you're going to do. It's not age dependent. Oral medication first. And then one of the other therapies next, if oral medications don't work. And yeah, absolutely use the penile injections, 100%. The oldest man so far that I've put a penile implant in was 87. I agree that he had a 63-year-old girlfriend, and but he, he was super happy with this thing, right? And I have another guy who's 88, who's probably going to be getting one in the near future. So he will then be my oldest person I put an implant in. And what's the oldest man I would put an implant in? There is no... There is no age cutoff, right? You know, I mean, we're talking about quality of life. You know, if you want an erection, I don't care what your age is. If you want it, and if I can help you, I'm going to help you do it. Uh, so that's a long-winded way to say, no, you're not too old for injections. Go talk to your urologist and get started. Already <clears throat> encouraging. Next question here uh, just came live in the chat. This person wants to know if riding a bicycle causes ED. Uh, I guess it depends on how you're riding it. Uh, I don't, I, I don't believe it does. Alrighty. Next question. <clears throat> um, saw this one in the chat and also had it from before. This person's wondering how they can find a prosthetic urologist or surgeon rather without calling around and asking every office. That's edcure.org or you can go to this website right here. Next question here. Um, this person wants to know if injection therapy is safe if you have stints or take heart medications. Yes, if you're if you're healthy enough to actually engage in sexual intercourse, then uh, you know the injection therapy is is safe. Stents are not usually an issue, um, and this is actually a common misconception amongst a number of my patients. They say, "Oh, I, I have a coronary stent." I said, 
do you know do you take nitroglycerin no i haven't needed that since you know i got the stents placed and i if a patient has a cardiologist and if there are some active issues that are going on, i'll say you know talk to your cardiologist or sometimes i'll talk to their cardiologist you know we have we have an integrated electronic uh, medical record system um you know in our in our area so a lot of times i will just shoot a message right over to the cardiologist and just say hey you know so and so is just in my office he wants to start um you know this medication and whether it's you know one of the oral medications or the injections um you know always get clearance from them and normally the answer is yeah he's fine go ahead um in terms of um you know i think i think we're we're specifically wondering if let's say you have a patient who takes or has a prescription for nitroglycerin for unstable chest pains that they need to take in general it's okay to use the injections in that circumstance, because those injections stay very local inside the penile erectile tissue. They're not like the pills that go systemic. Alrighty. <clears throat> Next question here, um, kind of similar, but a little bit more general. This person wants to know if there's any known medications, like general medications that could be causing ED. Oh yeah, definitely a lot. So, you know, beta blockers are notorious for that. Um, you know, things like metoprolol, low pressure, it's very common that I'll have a guy who comes into my office who says, everything was fine until my you know, cardiologist put me on this blood pressure medication. And I get no erections whatsoever. Um, so that, you know, that's a problem. Um, also things like uh, uh, mood stabilizers like Prozac, you know, antidepressants, very, very powerful anti-erection medications. So uh, you know, in general, my, my favorite treatment in those cases is to see if there's an alternative to the offending medication that the patient can take instead, like an alternative to a beta blocker for the people with high blood pressure or maybe something different um, as, an, as, a, as a treatment for depression. I'm never the one to stop a medication because um, at least not one that I have not started myself. So if I didn't start the patient on a given medication, I'm not telling them to stop. So I'm not telling them to stop their high blood pressure medication, but I'm telling them to go back to their maybe their primary doctor or their cardiologist and see, are there other options? Um, but this is also an indication to potentially start looking at things like oral medications specifically to counteract, you know, the erectile dysfunction, um, you know, or something along those lines. Certainly. So another question from the chat here, this person asked, how to over overcome lack of ability to ejaculate? That is tough. So um, it depends on why you're not ejaculating. So there are, and, 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 and here's a deeper question. Are you having an orgasm and not ejaculating? So there are two different things here. There's an ejaculation, which is just not ejaculating. And there's an orgasmia, and that's different. So an ejaculation, Sometimes, sometimes there's something called retrograde ejaculation, which is basic, which is clinically the same thing, where instead of the semen coming out of the penis, it goes back up into the bladder, and that can happen after you've had uh, certain types of prostate procedures. If you've had your prostate removed, you ain't gonna ejaculate ever again. Um, you know, there are other things. Certain medications will also cause that. Um, things like Flomax, which is a medication for uh, prostate enlargement will cause retrograde ejaculation where it's basically a dry orgasm. Um, there are, are other men who actually have an orgasmia uh, where they're not having an orgasm at all. And boy, is that frustrating. Uh, so what can you do for that? This is also another uh, area where I will encourage um, you know, coordinating with a sex therapist because a lot of times they will have strategies that can help. There's also a medication um, called oxytocin, which I've had some success with. Uh, it's not a silver bullet, but and correct me if I'm wrong. Does, does MenMD still still formulate that the oxytocin or no? Yes, you do. You do, yeah. So so you know you take that. Uh, I believe it's about 10 minutes before sexual intercourse, and it can actually help to bring about orgasm in those patients who have been having difficulty. It's not everybody. Um, and it is an off-label uh, use of that drug. That drug is actually uh, used in pregnant women to uh, to bring about contractions to stimulate labor. I don't know why it helps some men with orgasm, but it does. 
And I always offer that to men who are having issues with an orgasmia, if that's the problem. If they say, no, I'm, I, I feel like I'm having an orgasm, but nothing's coming out. Then we look at other things like the other medications in their list, or maybe if they've had certain types of procedures in the past. Alrighty, looks like we uh, just ran out of time here. So we're gonna go ahead and close out the show. I'd like to thank Dr. Pregnanzer for taking the time to present today. And we'd also like to thank everyone for listening and attending this MedMD Real Talk webinar. We hope it was informative and you'll join us again in the future. If you'd like to learn more, you have a few options. There are also more resources in the Resource Center on menmd.com. You can visit this page for instructional videos, guides, expert articles, and more. You can call MenMD at 857-233-5837 or log into the password-protected, secure MenMD portal to schedule an appointment with a MenMD personal health assistant. And finally, you can learn more about penile implants and insurance coverage by visiting edcure.org. I'd like to thank everyone again for attending today's webinar, and we'll see you at the next one.